So we're looking at John chapter 12 and verse 27. Let's hear God's word. <clears throat> now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the rule of this world be cast out. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, we have heard from the Lord that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. This is God's word. Amen. Well, I suppose all of us have our own way of looking at life. Uh, it's formed from when we're a child and our, our experience growing up, our parents, our family background, and, and then it gets more set as we come to be a young adult, but it, it can shift around depending upon an experience we have, perhaps a very positive experience like falling in love and it makes it seem like it's constantly spring in the air, even in the winter in Chicago, you know, or, um, or maybe something traumatic, and it, it shifts the way we look at life. We no longer look at life in quite the same way. We have a new lens through which we look at life. People have this, all of us have this way of looking at life. One way of characterizing this way of looking at life is as a paradigm, a paradigm. And if you change the way you look at life, it could be said that you are having a paradigm shift. This is a phrase that was invented not by me, but by a philosopher of science some years ago. A paradigm and a paradigm shift. We have, all of us, our own way of looking at life. And sometimes those ways of looking at life do change. We have a favorite sporting team, uh, and then perhaps that changes, though I think not often in Chicago. If you're a Cubs fan, you are one until you die, I think. Um, but sometimes it does change, and it can be a way of looking at life um, more seriously, about a more serious matter like politics, or even about religion. And the passage we're looking at uh, this morning, the crowds are faced with a paradigm-shifting opportunity. There is a voice from heaven. Surely, if anything, this would change the way they looked at life, that they looked at God, they looked at each other, the way they looked at Jesus, but actually it did not. And so John is telling us this story here in John's Gospel to confront us, to offer to us the same opportunity that was offered to them. Here is Jesus, what will we make him? Will we walk in the light? There is an opportunity for our way we look at life, our paradigm, to be brought into line with believing in Jesus? Will we have the life to the full that John's gospel says Jesus came to offer? Here's this paradigm shifting moment with the voice from heaven. What will be our response? That's what John is saying to us in his gospel. Well, let's look at the story and see as we go through it. So it begins in verse 27 with Jesus openly sharing his inner emotions. Now is my soul troubled. I love it when Jesus shares what he is thinking about, what he is feeling. Now is my soul troubled. My dear friends, if Jesus himself could at times feel troubled, then even the most godly Christian will at times himself or herself feel disturbed or troubled or in difficulty. Do not beat yourself up if you love Jesus and yet your soul is feeling troubled. Jesus' soul felt troubled. The Christian life is not one long cruise down the French Riviera. There are troubles in this world. 
And Jesus felt those troubles, and even godly Christians will at times. Now is my soul troubled, Jesus says, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. What is this hour? Well, the hour, of course, is that uh, the hour that Jesus is speaking about is the hour of his crucifixion. Remember that we are in the second half of John's gospel. We're always focused on Jesus' glorification through the cross, through his death and resurrection. The hour or the time for this has now come. But the time had come for him to be crucified, troubled Jesus. Of course, that is also instructive. Courage, Christian courage, is not the absence of fear or difficulty or trouble. It is not the absence of fear. It is doing the right thing even in the face of fear. Even when we are feeling troubled, still doing the right thing. Jesus, you see, had taught them that in the same way a grain of wheat must fall into the ground and die in order to bear much fruit, so he must die on the cross and rise again in order to bear much fruit of people from all over the world coming to be saved, the great fruit of the global harvest of the gospel. Yet Jesus was not looking forward to his crucifixion in any kind of glib manner. It was not going to be easy. He was troubled by it. And as I say, I think this is deeply instructive for us. The church today, I believe, the church at large in general, Christians today, Christianity today, needs to rediscover the heroism of Christian suffering. So often, preachers like me want to always put an easy button on everything. It's easy. I'm going to make it easy for you. You just follow what I say, and your life will never be in trouble again. And of course, the truth is that can never be the case in this world. And we rob Christians of the opportunity for heroism in the face of even trouble. We need to rediscover the heroism of Christian suffering. One man I knew took care of his wife in her dementia. I used to visit him once a week to learn from his wisdom. He was a very godly older man. Every week I go to him and ask him questions. And as we sat and talked, I discovered that he had had three children. One had died, another had committed suicide, the final had fallen down a flight of stairs, knocked herself out and drowned in her own spittle. And when that man stood up before a group of college students and told the story of his suffering in the face of all this, and God's faithfulness in his suffering. It was an extraordinary moment. We need to rediscover the art of the heroism of Christian suffering. If you're going through suffering and feeling troubled, you are in the moment, the hour, when a great heroism is opening up potentially before you, a great opportunity for witness. See what Jesus says. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. In other words, there's a purpose for his suffering, as there is a purpose for all Christian suffering. We like to think of finding our purpose being a way to have great flourishing without any pain. And of course, it's wonderful not to be in any difficulty. And if you are in that situation, that's great. But it will not last forever. And it could be that for you, as it was for Jesus, your key purpose will be expressed not through all the good things that have happened to you, but through the way you stay with Christ and with God through the challenging things that occur to you. Remember what the Apostle Paul said, we are hard pressed, but not crushed, perplexed, but not destroyed. We have this treasure in a jar of clare, so that the all-surpassing power may be seen to be from God, not from us. Our light and momentary troubles achieve for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. There is a purpose to Christian suffering, and therefore there is heroism for the Christian in the face of suffering. Indeed, what is more, here is the glory, verse 28. Father, glorify your name. The glory of God is found in the cross of Jesus Christ. What an extraordinary thought. Father, glorify your name. The glory of God is found in the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, when you are facing suffering, could you at least pray as Jesus prayed? You know what it's like when you're going through suffering, you're not sure what to say. You don't even know what to pray. You don't know where to turn for help. You don't know what the right thing is to say or the right thing is to do. Could you at least at those moments use these words of Jesus' Father, glorify your name. Could you at least use these words when you are facing suffering? Whether you are put on a pedestal after a sporting success or put on a gurney as you're wheeled into the operating room, could you say what Jesus said? Father, glorify your name. Of course, that is our desire as a church above all, that God will be glorified through everything we do, 
Soli Deo Gloria, as it is in Latin, to God alone be the glory. Father, glorify your name. But now we come to this moment, this paradigm shifting moment that was responded to in such different ways by the crowd. Here comes the voice from heaven, verse 28, then a voice from heaven, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. This voice from heaven, the voice of God, the Father says that His name has been glorified, that is, in Jesus and His life so far, and His name will be glorified, that is, ultimately through Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, in John's gospel, this is the only time that a voice from heaven speaks, and John puts it here for a reason. In the other gospels, we are told two other times when there's a voice from heaven at Jesus' baptism and at his transfiguration. But here in John, this voice is only recorded this moment to underline and focus upon the theme of this second part of John's gospel, that Jesus is glorified through his death and resurrection. Now surely, surely, a voice from heaven, surely they would believe, surely they would follow Jesus, surely they'd be persuaded now. I remember one man I spent many years talking to about Jesus and faith in Jesus. He came from a religious background, he grew up going to church, but he did not have a living and personal relationship with Jesus. He had many questions, and it was a great privilege to be able to talk with him about all these questions and answer them. There came a moment when all the questions he could think of had been answered, at least to his satisfaction. I looked at him and said, what else do you need? His answer was, I need a sign, a sign from God. These people had received many signs. Lazarus was raised from the dead, and now, what is more, they actually hear the voice of God the Father from heaven. This is the pinnacle. This is the ultimate. In the same way that the voice of God was heard by God's people in the Old Testament, the giving of the Ten Commandments, so now comes the voice of God the Father. This, Jesus, is the one to listen to who's the fulfillment of the Old Testament. It is Jesus and the cross that puts together both the Old Testament and the New Testament as one whole. This Jesus is the one in whom God will be glorified and will be glorified again. What more could they possibly need to believe? But look, look at how their paradigm, the way they're looking at life, their framework, the lens through which they look at life, the ears and what they choose to hear, the ears and what they choose to hear, their hearts and what they want to believe affects how they receive this voice from heaven. Look at verse 29. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. What an extraordinary thing to say. There's a voice from heaven and they say, in effect, this is what they're saying, must be thunder looks like a storm. That is their response. Benjamin Franklin went to hear the great evangelist George Whitfield preach. George Whitfield was probably the greatest evangelist the English-speaking world has ever come across probably the greatest preacher in the English language. Extraordinary orator, an amazing preacher. Benjamin Franklin went to hear him preach. This is what he did while George Whitfield was preaching. First, he calculated by um, the radius how many people could fit within that circle and hear George Whitfield preach. And so historians have a reliable estimate that actually outside tens of thousands of people could hear George Whitfield preach. That's what Benjamin Franklin did while George Whitfield was preaching the gospel to him. And then when George Whitfield was speaking about the orphanage that he set up and asking people to trust in Jesus and give their lives to Jesus and give money to the orphans to take care of the orphans, Benjamin Franklin, who determined to give nothing to this orphanage good cause, found himself giving a little bit and then a little bit more at each flash of rhetoric. And his conclusion, what a voice. What an orator. But as far as we know, Benjamin Franklin did not personally trust in Jesus, as far as we know. In other words, he said, it thundered, and that was it. It is such a danger, isn't it, for us all? I remember a friend of mine taking someone to hear a gifted preacher, and that person afterwards just saying, well, he certainly knows how to string a sentence together. But the message made no impact on him. Some said it thundered. It's just human psychology, just emotion. If the Spirit by the Word of God is convicting you this morning of the glory of Jesus, do not attribute it to mere thunder. And don't do what the other part of the crowd did. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. 
This too is a common tactic. They're thinking perhaps of the tradition that angels are present at the giving of the law. So in one sense, they're doing better than those who just said it was thunder. At least they have some sort of biblical framework while they're listening. But what they're doing is removing themselves from being on the receiving end of the message. An angel has spoken to him. This too is a common tactic to avoid the Word of God coming to us in any kind of power. You often see it at missions conferences, I find. You know how it goes. The preacher at a missions conference is working up a head of steam and getting all passionate and convicting about how there needs to be a new call to send people to the missions field. And the person sitting there listening to this message about going to the missions field starts to pray that someone else will get the call. You know how it works. The call goes out to help with serving in some ministry, and we begin to wonder whether it would be a good fit for someone else. We see the offering plate get passed, and we wonder who there is who needs to do something about giving to the church, who it is, someone else. We think of the voice going to someone else, being for someone else, applying to someone else. Watch out for this tactic too. Not only is it common enough to attribute the supernatural to a mere natural occurrence, the voice of God through his word to mere psychology or emotion, some said it thundered, it is also common to avoid conviction by application redistribution. An angel has spoken to him. But what were they then meant to learn from this voice from heaven? Jesus explains in verses 30 to 33. Jesus answered, the voice has come for your sake, not mine. So the first thing they need to learn is the voice is for them. God speaks to us through his word. The Bible today, he speaks to you. He's speaking to you now through his word. You want to find guidance? Read the Bible. You want to know how to have a life of meaning and purpose? Read the Bible. Don't skim it. Skip it or skimp on it. Read it prayerfully, asking for God's Spirit to reveal yourself as God sees you and to reveal God as He truly is. The voice of God is for your sake. You know, this week I came across a news article that described how Christians in North Korea are risking their very lives to find copies of the Bible. How many copies of the Bible do you have in your home and how often do you use them? Are they being read? This is for your sake. Read it and benefit from it and be encouraged and strengthened by it. Jesus continues then to explain in what sense this voice is for their sake. This voice has come for your sake, not mine. For now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Jesus, of course, is referring to the devil C.S. Lewis famously said that there are two equal and opposite errors that people make with regard to the devil. They either ignore him altogether or they become fascinated by him. And when he was writing those words, he concluded that the West was falling into the trap of thinking that the devil did not exist. That may still be true in many circles. But more recently, there has been a massive, renewed fascination with spirits and demons, vampires and ghouls, witchcraft and wizardry. You know, more people today are reporting instances of demon possession than they have for decades. The Roman Catholic Church itself reports an uptick of 100% in the last decade of requests for exorcisms. The West is becoming fascinated by the paranormal by the spiritual side of life. Where then is the victory over the forces of darkness? At the cross. At the cross is where the ruler of this world is cast out. I once visited a uh, Islamic training school for imams in a Muslim country. It had been turned into a museum, so we were allowed inside. And I sat in the special chair reserved for the person who trained other imams. I have never felt such a wave of darkness and personal evil. These things are real. When we were doing church planting at a certain city for many years, it felt to us as if there was an evil monster walking the streets of that city. You you drove outside of the city for a mile and the, the darkness seemed to lift. 
But while we can underemphasize the reality, we can also overemphasize it and make more of it than the Bible teaches or run afraid when in Christ we have nothing about which to be afraid. It is the gospel that pushes back the forces of darkness. That city over time had a change of spiritual tone. You could almost sense it. Not through our power or any any methodology or strategy, but through the power of the cross by which the ruler of this world, according to Jesus, is cast out. Now, my friends, do not think it only happens in far away places or in strange lands. We are not ignorant of his schemes, hiding behind petty conflicts and relational breakdowns between Christians, whispering hate to other Christians in our ears. But at the feet of Jesus, at the cross of Jesus, the ruler of this world is cast out. And if you sense some impenetrable blockage between you and another Christian, then apply the cross. Remember who God is. Remember who you are, how sinful you are, and how much you've been forgiven because of the cross of Jesus. Remember what Jesus has done for you. And therefore, offer forgiveness to one another for all that you have been forgiven. We need only stand, says Paul, for Christ has the victory. We stand in his victory, in the power of his might. It is at the cross that the rule of this world is cast out. We put on the armor of God, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, feet fitted with the redness that comes to the gospel of peace, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and we pray in the spirit on all occasions, and we stand, stand in the power of his might, which through the cross casts out the ruler of this world. This is the great secret for spiritual impact. It is at the cross that the ruler of this world is cast out. We lift up the cross every Sunday morning, therefore, every time we gather, for it is at the cross that spiritual victory occurs. So they're meant to learn from this voice that God's word is for them, for your sake, and they're meant to learn that now through the cross is the time when the root of this world will be cast out. But they're also meant to learn, verse 32, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Here, I think, is perhaps the most important word spoken by Jesus in all the Gospels for us today. Why is that, you say? Well, remember the context. It is the Passover. Jesus is going up to Jerusalem to die on the cross and then be raised again. The Lamb of God will take away the sin of the world. Through him, in him, we have life and life to the full. And at this moment, this hour, the Greeks, non-Jewish people from outside of Israel, have come along and are wanting to see Jesus. Sir, we would see Jesus. The world is going to be saved through Jesus. These Greeks are the first sign of that global harvest to come. And so Jesus Jesus teaches now that it is his glory through his death and resurrection, which is how the Father is saying in the voice of heaven that he will glorify himself when he is lifted from the earth. That is when he dies on the cross, as John puts it in verse 33. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die, that is on the cross. And when that happens, when he dies and rises again, he will draw all people to myself, as he puts it to himself. Jesus does not mean all people without exception. Otherwise, these crowds would also believe in him. He means all people without distinction, which is why the Greeks, these non-Israelites, are now coming to believe as a sign of the coming global harvest. In other words, this is why these words are perhaps the most important words in the Bible for us today, because the way to have unity, harmony, racial reconciliation is through the lifting up of Jesus as he is lifted up on the cross. The way that all people are drawn to him without distinction of any racial or any class group, the way that happens is through the cross and the proclamation of that cross. If you want people to get along, what you do is focus on what they have in common. When we call people to Christ and his cross, we, by Jesus' explicit intent, call all people who he will now draw to himself. The great Augustine put it like this. This is one of his dictums or principles. The only thing that really unites people is a common desire for the same ends. And that is one of the many reasons why at Cottage Church we are all about the gospel. Since 1860, Cottage Church has focused on God's word, the gospel. And we today are all about God's word, about the gospel. And as we do that, we draw all people without distinction to Christ. You keep Christ 
and the cross at the center of the hub, then the spokes of the wheel spin in harmony around the center, that is Christ and the cross. You say, what does that mean? It means this. In small groups, in adult communities, in committee meetings, let us always keep coming back to Christ and his cross. You put the Christ and the cross at the center to the Bible and God's word. As one of the old mottos of college church puts it, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. And out of that, out of Christ at the heart, comes our commitment to love and practical care and justice, disability ministries, resale shops, outreach community center, and more. I've been involved in many churches through my life, and College Church is one of the most socially active churches I have ever seen. And it does it by keeping Christ and the cross at the heart. We elevate Christ when we gather, and then we go out to make a difference in the world. And now we come to the heart of their paradigm and its need for a paradigm shift from verse 34 to the end of the passage. So look with me at verse 34. So the crowd answered him. (laughs) They answered him. They cannot accept what he is saying. And they're in debate with him. They've heard the voice from heaven. And they've heard Jesus' own teaching, but they're still fixed in their old framework, their old paradigm. They answered him, we have heard from the law. That is referring to the scriptures of the Old Testament, the Torah in particular, the first five books. We have heard from the law that the Christ or Messiah or God's anointed king remains forever. This is their framework. Their framework is that Christ, or Messiah, when he comes, will set up a new kingdom and he will rule forever. That is their expectation. And what Jesus is teaching and doing does not fit into that expectation. And so they have questions. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? What an ironic question. Up until this moment in John's Gospel, Jesus has taught on the Son of Man and who he is 10 times already, and here they are asking yet again. This is something he has taught on over and over again. The Son of Man was a term derived from the book of Daniel, where Daniel prophesied that a divine human figure will come. And so by calling himself the Son of Man, Jesus is taking that term from Daniel and filling it with his own person and his own teaching. Jesus is putting together the teaching in the Old Testament about the Messiah in a way that rabbinic teachers at Jesus' day did not. They thought the Messiah would come to rule and throw out the Romans. But Jesus is saying that the Messiah is the Son of Man and the Son of Man is going to suffer and die and rise again. Jesus is putting together teaching about the kingdom of God with the Messiah, being a divine human figure in Daniel, with the Messiah being a suffering servant in the book of Isaiah. He is saying that he, the Son of Man, is the Messiah, the Christ, and that he, Christ, has come to be crucified and rise again, and that is his glory. For through it, all people will be drawn to him, as was happening already through these Greeks coming to ask to see Jesus, and had just been confirmed by the very voice of God the Father himself, speaking directly to them from heaven. What more could they want? What more teaching could they possibly need? And so Jesus does not directly answer their question because their question has already been answered many times. My dear friends, listening to Bible teaching, sitting under Bible teaching for many years is a great thing, but is also a risky thing, even a dangerous thing. How's that, you say? There comes a moment when the call to repent of our sins, put our trust in Christ, be born again by God's Spirit, live in commitment to Christ and His church, become a disciple of Jesus, and send your life on God. There comes a time when that message has not only been heard, it has been heard and heard again, and the decision needs to be made. That's what Jesus does here in reply to their question. He does not answer their question, for he has already answered it if they've been listening. Instead, he says the time is short, and now is the time they need to decide whether they're going to follow him or not. Verse 35, so Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. 
By the light, he means himself. He is the life, and in him is life to the full. He is light, and in him is no darkness at all. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he depicts that, describes that, visualizes that, especially often in John's gospel, as lights. There's darkness all around. Here comes the lights. He shows us the way to live, and he gives us the life and the life to the full. It's like the lights being turned on in a dark room. The light is among you for a little while longer. That is, Jesus is soon going to die, rise again, and then ascend to be with the Father of God. So walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of or children of the light. In other words, now is the moment. It's decision time. He won't be here that much longer. They've heard all the teaching. What are they going to do about it? And he's urging them to walk in the light, that is to believe in him, commit to him, be a disciple of him, that they might have life and life to the full. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. What? A scary sentence. After this moment, they do not hear from him again. Oh, Jesus will prepare his disciples for his crucifixion. He is crucified himself. But the crowds, they never get to hear Jesus preach again. This is the moment. After this, it's too late. They had one last chance. Perhaps this is your last chance. Uh, Just uh, this week, I've heard of several deaths. Some of us are not as young as we were. Will you even make it back to church next week? Others of us are young and we think we are immortal. Let me break it to you, young men and young women. You are not immune from the vagaries of car accidents and sudden unexpected death. But even if you are alive physically next week, will your heart still be open to hear from Jesus? The heart can say no to Jesus so often there comes a tipping point where no is what has been said. That could be the case. For some of us here this morning, you have said no to Jesus about that sin in your life. You've been here on Sunday and when you're singing songs or when the pastor's praying or when I'm preaching, you know that the the finger of God, God is pointing out to you in your life that sin. But you don't want to give it up. You don't want to repent. You would rather do what you want than what Jesus wants. You've heard the claims of Jesus, but you you want a sign as if a voice from heaven or a word from God or the very Bible open to you was not sufficient. If you do not believe this on this evidence, then no amount of evidence will persuade you. There is, of course, a time to explore, to ask questions, to think, to reflect, and there is a time to decide. And there comes a moment when if that decision point is passed, the very lack of a decision becomes a decision. For some here, that moment is now. The light is on. 
The word of God is being heard. Christ is present by his spirit. He longs to embrace you with his loving arms. He's here. If you do not now respond to Jesus, it could be that for you, as it was for them, that when Jesus had finished speaking, he went and hid himself from them. I pray that would be true of no one here. Call on God while he is near. Put your trust in the light while you have it. You're going to have the light just a little longer, and then it will be too late. It is possible for some here that God will call you to your deathbed before I speak to you again. For others, you are hardening your hearts. You cannot see the light. Now is the time. Now is the hour. Do not delay. Let us pray then to God. Our Lord God, I pray that we would not delay. Lord God, would you by your spirit move among your people now, convict of sin, encourage the brokenhearted, strengthen the feeble, give hope to the discouraged, open hearts and minds to receive you. Let's have a moment of quiet. Perhaps you sense that God, by His Spirit, is convicting you of something you need to deal with. Would you, would you deal with that before Him now in the quiet? Would you confess it to Him? Would you ask God for help and His strength? Would you make a new covenant commitment to follow Him? Renew your covenant with Him. Would you do that now? In the quiet. before it is too late. For some, you've been thinking about these claims of Christ for a while, and a friend's brought you to church this morning, and you're presented with an opportunity to respond. Would you respond this morning for the first time? Would you ask God to forgive you? Would you ask for the power of His Spirit to fill you would you trust him and ask him to save you? Oh Lord God, we pray that we would glorify you and we would come to the Father, you Father, through your Son, Jesus, and give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.